popular will, popular interests have very little relevance for succeeding in counterinsurgency when we actually look at successful cases. I'm Sean Lynn Jones. I'm the editor of International Security, a quarterly journal that's published here at the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. And today, I'm talking to Jacqueline Hazelton, who's professor of strategy and policy at the U.S. Naval War College. Professor Hazelton is the author of an article that recently appeared in International Security. The article is The Hearts and Minds Fallacy, Violence, Coercion, and Success in Counterinsurgency Warfare. It was recently published in the summer 2017 issue of the journal. Thanks very much for being with us today, Professor Hazelton. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate your inviting me. It's good to have you here. Your article touches on a very important topic because the United States has just been involved in fighting two major counterinsurgency wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And there's been a huge debate and a lot of books and articles have been written over the lessons of those wars and the right way to fight a counterinsurgency campaign. And what you call the good governance approach in the article is more or less what a lot of people call the hearts and minds approach. And that's really the term that's out there when people talk about it. Is that right? That's right. It's also been called the comprehensive approach, the population-centric approach. The idea is that the people are the prize. The government, the government needs to gain popular support if it is going to defeat the insurgency. And is it fair to say that that's now essentially the conventional wisdom in the counterinsurgency studies field? I think that is fair to say. That. And how does your argument and your, your recommendation differ? Popular will, popular interests have very little relevance for succeeding in counterinsurgency when we actually look at successful cases. What matters is... First of all, cutting the insurgents off from the resources that they need, whether material or not material. And unfortunately, what that often means is using brute force to control the people, putting them in prison camps, for example. It also requires making deals with some pretty ugly characters, warlords, killers, insurgents who have defected, in order to form a new political coalition that will be stable for the longer term. Now, the scholars and analysts and sometimes military officers who've argued for a good governance or hearts and minds approach often point to the case of Malaya uh, from the late 40s all the way through the 1950s, where the British waged a long-running and ultimately successful, they claim, counterinsurgency campaign. You've looked at that case. What does it really prove? Does it support the hearts and minds theory? Malaya unfortunately does not support the belief that it takes good governance to defeat insurgency, Sean. It's a very, very ugly case. Very, very high cost in terms of ethics and in terms of human lives. Are there any good examples of how your approach, a more coercive approach, has actually succeeded and led to victory? In fact, all of the, the cases that are claimed as good governance successes by proponents of that approach turn out to look a lot more like the coercion theory of counterinsurgency success. El Salvador is an example, along with Malaya, along with the campaign against the Huck in the Philippines, the Greek Civil War after World War II, and possibly my favorite, the British campaign against the insurgency in Dofar in southern Oman. This was in, in, during the Cold War, 1960s to mid-1970s. So the British backed the Sultan of Oman against the communist nationalist insurgency in southern Oman. What happened there? The British failed repeatedly to get the Sultan to implement any of the reforms they wanted. The British defeated the insurgency militarily by controlling the people, preventing the flow of resources to the insurgents, both from the populace and from the insurgent safe haven in Yemen, and by designing a military strategy that broke the insurgency down into bands and finally wiped them out. What's the most important thing that U.S. policymakers should take away from your article as they confront the problems in the world of 2017? I think the single most important takeaway for policymakers is that However appealing we may think liberal values are, it is unlikely that the United States 
has the ability to coerce its partners in host nations experiencing an insurgency to give up some of their power and wealth in order to end the insurgency. Focus on building a political coalition within the state that will allow you to co-opt rival elites and defeat the insurgency militarily. Well, I hope uh, that your advice is heeded and that uh, your article gets the attention it deserves. Thank you very much. We're just about out of time now, but I would like to thank you for being with us today. I've been talking with Jacqueline Hazelton, who's a professor at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island. Her article, The Hearts and Minds Fallacy, Violence, Coercion, and Success in Counterinsurgency Warfare, appears in the summer 2017 issue of International Security. Thanks again. Thank you.